Um, so Frank Chalk has been a representative of the Washington State House from the 43rd District since 1995 and Speaker of the House since 2002. He's a senior advisor for Solid Ground, formerly the Freeman Public Association, of which he was the executive director since 1983. In the early 1980s, he was a manager of the North Community Service Center and the Pike Market Senior Center. For more information, you can check out frankchop.org, and that's F-R-A-N-K-C-H-O-P-P.org. Kashama Swalt is an economics professor at Seattle Central Community College and a member of the American Federation of Teachers Local 1789. As an organizer with Socialist Alternative, she has been an activist in the Occupy Wall Street movement and an advocate of social justice for workers, women, LGBT people, and people of color. For more information, see stopthechop.org. That's S T O P T H E C H O P P. I tried to go there, it didn't go anywhere. Dot O R G. And so, um, with that, I am going to get to uh, the first question, of which I will ask um, who wants to answer first. I'll start. I think it's opening statements first. Oh, I'm sorry. Yes, opening statements, and then we will go to the questions. Thank you for noting that. Um, so. Speaker Chop will start, and um, after that, we will have an opening statement by Dr. Sawant, and then we'll have some rebuttals, and then I'll get to my questions. Well, great. Thank you very much for being here tonight. Um, I appreciate the uh, opportunity to speak at Seattle University in particular. I was a student here uh, a number of years ago. I also very much uh, appreciate the opportunity to talk to classes here at Seattle University, which I do about three or four times a year. Uh, I also want to thank Seattle University for hosting Tent City. Tent City was an organizing effort we started many years ago to draw attention to the homeless situation in our community. And uh, the folks that have organized over the years uh, came to Seattle U, and Seattle U gave them a place to have their Tent City to continue not only living there, but also making a statement. I feel that's extremely important. I appreciate Seattle University's support of that. Um, basically, this uh, campaign is for state representative. I ran for state representative in order to get things done. Uh, for my opening statement, I'd just like to give a few examples of what we've done just even this last year. The first one is that when you ask uh, people around the, the state, uh, not just in this district, but in other parts of the state, the biggest concern that many of the people raise is the whole notion of jobs. And so we passed the Jobs Now Act in the legislature, setting aside or allocating about $1.3 billion in funding for community uh, college projects, uh, affordable housing projects, a whole host of other uh, energy efficiency projects, essentially creating 22,000 jobs in this society right here in this state, doing projects all across the state. We we're very proud of that, and that was on top of a $7 billion jobs package that we passed a few years ago for transportation. That was about $7 million that's creating tens of thousands of jobs. When you go around and see these construction projects, that's what legislature did uh, to raise the revenue in order to fund those transportation projects. So we uh, stepped forward as opposed to the federal government, who is uh, basically in a dysfunctional state and not able to pass uh, Obama's uh, Jobs Act uh, at the federal level. We did it in Washington State. Second of all, we expanded the Apple Health for All Kids program. This is a program that we started a number of times, a number of years ago, uh, and essentially covers about half the uh, kids in this state with health care, comprehensive health care. Uh, it's up to uh, about 750,000 now. Uh, it's on the way to 800,000. The coverage of kids in the state with health care is about 98%, but that ain't good enough. We've got to get to 100%. We put some funding in this year to help on the outreach effort to get more uh, young people enrolled in Apple Health for all kids. And the main reason we did that was in order to succeed in school, you need to be healthy and ready to learn. We have uh, a tremendous program there, and if any of you would like to help on the outreach effort for that, please let me know. Because we fundamentally think that health care is a right of the people. Third, we expanded the Housing Trust Fund by a significant amount. And over the years, uh, the Housing Trust Fund actually, I helped co-found a number of years ago, to provide affordable housing for low-income people, uh, victims of domestic violence, homeless families, uh, veterans, etc. And we have, over a period of years, it doesn't happen overnight, we created 38,000 homes with the Housing Trust Fund. And when all told, it's over 100,000 people that have benefited 
from investment in the housing trust fund. And I feel very proud I was literally the person to start that, working in cooperation with a number of other folks uh, throughout the community, because it was a great community organizing effort. And I would greatly encourage you to go to the open house for the closest project, which is right here at 12th and Jefferson. It's a workforce housing project, 40 units, brand new, beautiful building. Uh, it's the grand opening of sometime in October, sponsored by Capital Housing. I encourage you to show up for the opening because it's a great, proud moment that we're able to stand together and provide workforce housing. And why is that important? Well, one of the things we were able to do this year was to pass legislation to set aside about 37% of the local hotel motel tax to build affordable housing. And that is one of those projects that is similar to that that we'll be doing in the future. Because the folks that work in the hotels, the restaurants, cannot afford to live here in this city. And that's why we need to step forward public investment. That's what we're doing. The last point, in the interest of time here, I think I've got a minute or so. I'm very proud that we passed marriage equality in the state. We stepped forward and passed not only marriage equality, but we repealed what was called the Defense of Marriage Act. The Defense of Marriage Act was put in place by Republicans in the legislature many years ago. It was a terrible act. We were the first state in the nation to overturn and repeal that. And then we went on to then pass marriage equality, because we feel that that notion of equality is a fundamental right. And I urge you all to help pass Referendum 74, because under our state constitution, citizens can get the signatures, so it's on a public vote, even though we passed in the legislature. And it's incredibly important for us to pass that and be the first state in the nation for marriage equality. Thank you very much. Opening statement from Dr. Sawant. Thank you, Dr. White. Uh, and uh, I request the audience to please let me know if I'm too far or too close to the microphone. Uh, thank you all for coming here. It is really an honor to participate in this debate, especially because it has been organized by students. As an educator, as a teacher, I, I feel very strongly about that. Uh, this is what I'm always encouraging my students to do, to engage in the political process. And so it's really exciting to see it happening in, you know, in, in action. Uh, and as uh, Ruth mentioned, my name is Shama Sawan. I am an organizer with Socialist Alternative. I'm also uh, an economics professor at Seattle Central Community College. I have taught at Seattle University too, and I see some of my students uh, in this room, uh, and that is really gratifying to me. Uh, I have also uh, been involved in the Occupy Wall Street peaceful protests in Seattle. I've been there from day one, and you know I hope to talk more about that. I'm also a rank and file member of the American Federation of Teachers, Local 1789, and I've been involved in uh, you know very recently in the uh, move, uh, movement to uh, uh, the march against the war on women on April 28th. We have a huge mobilization for that. We've also been involved, and I personally have been involved in the grassroots movement to uh, push for marriage equality. And as a teacher, I have experienced firsthand what is happening in this state. I see the enormous and horrific budget cuts having a huge and a hugely detrimental impact on students and on teachers like myself. We are, you know, we are both equally affected by it. Uh, and I've seen conditions worsening and worsening, and I can provide you know endless personal examples to illustrate that. Uh, but I wanted to spend the little time that I have in order to explain why we are running, why I am running, and what the role of the Democratic Party has been in this whole process. Since the economic recession hit in 2008, the state government has cut over $10.5 billion from essential services such as education, health, and human services, and it has cut uh, benefits and jobs for state employees. The state basic health program has been decimated with 1.7 billion in funding slashed, cutting 70,000 people off its roles, and these are extremely needy people. And as we are in an educational institution, I think it's very important to point out the cuts that have happened to education, both K through 12 and higher education. 2.7 million has been, has been cut from K through 12 education. 1.3 billion from higher education, and these are only you know, recent numbers. This is a process that has been going on for decades. And 
Our opponent, Speaker Chuck, has voted for virtually every major regressive budget uh, legislation that has been passed in the state since he's been in the legislature. Uh, just a few to mention, the recent attacks on uh, workers' comp, that is, uh, that provides a meager, uh, you know, compensation for workers who are injured on their job, and for penalizing early retirement for workers, and the cuts to education that we have already mentioned. The problem here is that we need to understand the role of Speaker Chop himself and the Democratic Party as a whole. Speaker Chop is not, not a rank and file member of the Democratic Party. He is the leader uh, and uh, the most powerful legislator in Olympia. Uh, he holds the first strings to uh, you know, a lot of the initiatives in the legislature, and he is the architect of these policies. And he has been in the legislature for 17 years, and he has been the Speaker of the House for 10 years, representing the Democratic Party majority. And so he hasn't just voted to slash budget for education and health care. He has led the charge. And in closing, I would like to say that the Democratic Party pays a lot of lip service to a lot of the issues that we care about. You heard that yourself. But I would urge you, as a fellow voter myself in the 43rd District, do not listen to their rhetoric merely, but look at their actions. You know, the proof of the pudding is in the eating. And I think well, the most important point we need to take home from this discussion today, which I hope to illuminate, is that the 99%, the working class, the ordinary people of the state of Washington, the students, we need our own political representation because we've seen what has happened with this endless merry-go-round of the Republican Party versus the Democratic Party, the Democratic Party versus the Republican Party, who essentially have a very similar agenda with very slight differences. It's more like one party with two factions. And it is high time that we questioned this state of affairs, this status quo, and spoke out against it. And I still sit before you today, not as a corporate politician, and, uh, but as an activist. And I think that is where we need to go, uh, really, to understand the role that the Democratic Party plays. I would say, follow the money. You know, look at the corporate funding that the Democratic Party has had over the decades, not just in this state, but in this entire country. Look at the funding, uh, that corporate funding that Speaker Chop has had himself over a lo long period of time. I don't mean just this time. This time, of course, if you look at the finances, they have, uh, you know, he has, you know, more than 10 times the budget we have. But that's because we are, we are not taking corporate funding. Because we know what happens when you take money from corporations, you are beholden to their agenda. And the reality is that the Republican Party is blatantly uh, against uh, the rights of ordinary people and students and the working class, but the Democratic Party pays lip service and throws us crumbs, but essentially carries out the same agenda. Initial rebuttal from uh, Speaker Chop, and then that will be followed by a rebuttal from Dr. Stone. Uh, well, first of all, I would encourage you to join the efforts across the state to organize on these social justice concerns. Uh, if you want to talk to me after the uh, time tonight or send my office an email, we have various organizing efforts going on in terms of funding education, workforce housing, health care for all, and a number of other things, uh, including uh, things that I know all of you care deeply about. Because this is an effort to organize people and get the votes over time. Uh, this, I wish the 43rd district uh, was uh, more than just my own district, but the reality is there are 49 legislative districts. The 43rd is one of those. But I want to make a correction here in terms of the campaign funds. Uh, I actually, uh, what I do when I receive funds, I turn it over to a fund that is essentially designed to help other progressive candidates in other districts, districts that are not like the 43rd. So whatever I get in, I, what's called surplus, to these other candidates, so that then they can help us pass things like marriage equality, and Apple Health for all kids, and the Housing Trust Fund, and a better working conditions for people. This is very important that we look at where we need to do, because what's critical is to assemble the votes to move forward and pass an agenda. It's not uh, good enough just to talk about it, you have to assemble the votes. And that's what I've done. And in terms of corporate contributions, over the years I can give you several examples. 
where, for example, one year, uh, this was years ago, I got a whole, uh, I think it was around $2,800 for what are called payday lenders. What came in from individuals from the payday lending industry, I didn't know what they were, and as soon as I found that out, I took it up, turned it right over to a group called the Statewide Poverty Action Network at $2,800, which is organizing the effort against the payday lenders. And we passed several pieces of legislation to uh, restrict and uh, make more just that payday lending industry. So these corporate contributions come in, I turned it right over to the group that was fighting those very corporations. That's the kind of effort we need to do. But it's important to keep in mind that we have to move forward together because it is a state of Washington and we need to assemble the votes to move forward. It's not just one district. Uh, I've been asked to stand up because I think that helps the audience, so I'm going to do that. Um, Speaker Chow has been uh, saying a lot of uh, interesting and very nice sounding things about getting things done. He mentioned that he wants to get things done and it's not enough to just talk. Uh, you know, basically implying that you know we we are talking, but it's important to assemble the votes. And the 43rd district does not represent uh, the entire state. I would say that I agree. Yes, the 43rd district does not represent the entire state. There are political variations, but I I want to point out that both the legislators that are currently representing the 43rd district actually are well to the right of what their district is. And so, if you really want to represent your district, then why don't you represent them? They, uh, you know, your district is uh, very strongly in favor of single-payer health care, uh, very strongly in favor of public transit. I mean, I live in Capitol Hill. People love their public transit. Where is the funding for that? And so, uh, you know, and, and several other points, I'm, I, I, want, I have limited time, so I'm going to uh, pick a few. Uh, Speaker Chop has mentioned DOMA, which of course we totally uh, and completely support marriage equality. And like I said, I was out on the streets myself fighting for that. But I want to say that the Democratic Party has been in power for decades. This is a more liberal state. This is not Alabama, let's face it. Overall, this is a liberal state. They have been in power for decades. They have even had super majority for a couple of years. What have they done with that? I mean, we don't want, with, with such, such a, if, if I had such a powerful support in the legislature and such a majority, then you would have seen single payer health care, you would have seen many other changes, you would have seen a massive green jobs program, basically everything that we are talking about in our, uh, you know, in our, in our leaflet. And, uh, you know, uh, in closing, I wanted to mention that a speaker mentioned uh, the Jobs Now Act. Uh, we need to look at how they are funding it and how they are creating it. First of all, you mentioned that it's creating 20,000 jobs. Let's be clear, 17,800 jobs at last check have been cut from the state. You know, so these are good union jobs that have been cut. There's no mention of that. And the Jobs uh, Act is being funded by a 50 cent gasoline tax and the 520 toll. These are both highly regressive. So that's like you know taking money from the poor and then giving a little bit of it back and saying here you know we're we're doing something for you. I think the most important point that has not yet been mentioned is that we live in a really wealthy state which has super wealthy people and enormously profitable corporations. Why are they taxing ordinary people who have already been battered by uh, years of? Uh, uh, you know, regressive taxation by by the recession. Why don't they tax the big corporations, which essentially pay no taxes on their uh, on their royalty? Okay, I will now ask um, the first question, and. Um, we will start with an answer from Dr. Sawant and then uh, Speaker Chop, and then they will reply to each other's responses. So the first question, the Occupy movement last fall brought into discourse the question of class and the unprecedented gulf between the 1% and the 99%. What are your views on the Occupy movement and what do you advocate to address the extreme economic polarization in the state of Washington? Dr. Sawant. Thank you. So, I wanted to start by acknowledging how powerfully different a time we are living in since even a year ago. 
The Occupy movement crystallized and gave phenomenal expression to the anger felt by ordinary people and the youth at the conditions they are facing. Anger against the bailouts, anger against the inequality, and I would also like to point out, you know, as an economist myself, that the so-called budget crisis here in this state and nationally is a result of a crippling economic crisis that was precipitated by the financial aristocracy, not by ordinary people. But the burden of that recession has been placed squarely on the shoulders of ordinary people, on students, on the poor. And I want to point out that, you know, the Democrats always like to talk about how conservative America is. And you know what I want to say? That, you know, I, I didn't grow up in the U.S., but when I came to the U.S., and since I've been here, the thing that strikes me the most is how not conservative the American people are. If you talk about any progressive issue, and you look at the polls, the vast majority of the American population is progressive. You know, so Occupy is another proof of that. You know, the Democrats say the people are conservative, but the vast majority of people in America supported Occupy, while only 10% supports the U.S. Congress. So you do the math. <laughs> and I also wanted to point out, you know, this, this, you know, we are, we are having a really historical and unprecedented discussion here. Let's be clear, this is not a debate as usual from, between a Republican and a Democrat, or a more conservative and less conservative Democrat in the primaries. This is a debate between a democratic socialist and a leader of the Democratic Party. So it's, it's an unprecedented thing that has never, uh, at least in my lifetime, hasn't happened in the United States. And I wanted to use Occupy to point out the differences between a socialist and uh, you know, a big business party person. My own role in Occupy is an illustration of this. I have been in Occupy Seattle since the first General Assembly. And I, again, I see a lot of you, uh, I have been shoulder to shoulder with you in the GAs, in the cold and the rain uh, and the ice. You know, we were there together. We were there because we wanted to make a change. We wanted to make our voice heard. And that movement hasn't ended yet. That has only begun. But Speaker Chow belongs to the party that controls the Seattle Police Department, which actually played a heinous role in uh, carrying out repression against Occupy activists. The most, perhaps the most well-known victim of this is Dorley Rainey, who is sitting right here, uh, an octogenarian activist who was pepper sprayed by the Democratic Party establishment controlled police department. And I want to be, I want to say, Dorley has very graciously endorsed our campaign. And I am so proud to have her as an endorser. And I am so proud to represent the causes that she represents. And I am proud to declare that we haven't taken any money from corporations. And in terms of how to address the questions that Occupy has brought up, I think Occupy itself is an answer. What we need is a mass movement. And we need bigger and stronger movement that can clarify what the people want and actually work for it. And we are running this campaign in the spirit of Occupy. We are an activist campaign. And I urge you all to embrace this campaign in the same spirit that you embraced Occupy and let us make change. Because history shows that change comes not by supporting the Democratic Party or the Republican Party, but change comes when you go out on the streets. The Occupy movement is playing a very, very important role in this society. There is so much greed on Wall Street that it takes a movement to call attention to it and to work towards changing that. Uh, my own family background is from a working class background. My dad went to work in the coal mines over in Roslyn, Washington at 12 years old. Okay, his job with the coal coming out of the mine shaft was to take the rocks out of it so the coal could go to the dumpster to be transferred out by uh, coal uh, trains. And so this notion of standing up for working people and making society a more socially just community is very important to me personally. Now, how do you deal with this thing? Well, there's, I give you three examples of what we need to do. First one is to, is to organize workers. I was so proud uh, just a week ago to be at the 10th anniversary of the Home Care Workers Union. That's the SEIU, thanks for one of your members being here. Uh, at SEIU 775. 
We helped organize that effort. In fact, I was the guy who recognized the union to represent home care workers. The first time it ever happened in this state, that was through the Grand Mall Public Association. Uh, then that, uh, we brought in the Seattle, excuse me, the Service Employees International Union to take it from there. It was absolutely inspiring to be at that 10th year anniversary. That union now represents 42,000 home care workers. And I was really proud to be there because they featured me as one of the keynote speakers. Because they recognized, they recognized that I've been with them for years fighting for their cause. To get them a better wage, get them health care benefits, to get them training, etc. I've been there, and I tell you, I wish you were there because you would have been absolutely inspired by that effort. And they've been right there with you in terms of the Occupy Movement. Many of the speeches referred to the Occupy Movement. The next group to organize, by the way, is the truck drivers of the Port of Seattle. I don't know if any of you have been there in terms of standing with those workers. Maybe you have. That's good. We're working. We had a meeting today to plot the next step there in terms of trying to get them, first of all, a decent wage and to get representation and labor and industries coverage in case they get injured. Uh, literally, the meeting we had today was very instructive in terms of how we can move forward and make progress on that issue because one of the most one of the groups that's treated most unfairly in the society right now are truck drivers at the Port of Seattle. Now, the launcher workers up in the cranes, they do pretty well because they had a movement many years ago. But the truck drivers are making very, very bad wages and are treating, being treated very disrespectfully. So that's the next group we need to organize. Second thing we need to do is to raise the minimum wage. Uh, I was part of the group through two initiatives to raise the minimum wage. In fact, uh, the one that was done most recently at my urging included not only a higher minimum wage, but to tie it to the cost of living increase. That was the first state in the nation to do that. That initiative got kicked off at my food bank, the Fremont Food Bank. I worked very closely with labor organizations throughout the state of Washington. And that mass movement passed the best minimum wage in the nation by 68% of the people. So I've been there. I extremely proud of my role in that. Next one is we need to have health care for all. This is extremely important. We've done a lot towards that goal with Apple Health for All Kids, which is basically at 98% coverage of all the kids in the state. If we're trying to get to 100%, if you want to help there, let me know. The next step is to uh, expand the Medicaid program through the basic health plan. In this last several legislative sessions, despite all the proposals to wipe those programs out, I'm the guy who led the effort to save them because I knew it was important not only to help those folks who needed health care, but also then to lay the groundwork for the expansion of Medicaid. The expansion of Medicaid in this state will mean another 350 to 400,000 people getting decent, comprehensive health care. And we set up the process to do that through the basic health plan. Thank you very much. Dr. Sawant will now reply. Thank you. Um, so I wanted to say that, you know, I'm, I, it's nothing new to me to have Democratic Party big wigs come and talk about Occupy and how wonderful it was, because this is nothing new. Activists across the ages know that whenever there are successful movements, the first thing that the establishment tries to do is ignore it. When they can't ignore it and it keeps growing, they try to crush it. When they can't crush it and it keeps growing, they try to co-opt it. So we need to be clear about where we stand in terms of what we need to do in order to win what we have to win for ordinary people. And I also want to point out another thing, as a socialist, you won't hear this often, so I'm pointing it out because I am a socialist and I have the, uh, the uh, amazing opportunity to be in front of you. What matters is not somebody's class background. You know, I know um, Speaker Chop has cozy stories about how he sat at the dinner table and uh, talked about uh, education and workers' rights. What matters is their class loyalty. Which class are they loyal to? And let's be clear, this is a conflict. If you are serving big business interests, then you are working against the interests of ordinary people. This is, not, uh, this is not a game, this is not a sport. And I also wanted to say, just in a very limited time I have, you know, there's a lot that I want to bring up, but I'll bring up one point. I don't understand when Speaker Chubb uses the word expansion in, the rela in relation to basic health. What has happened here is that the Republicans and Governor Gregoire wanted to, slap, wanted to you know, annihilate basic health and disability lifeline completely. What Speaker Chop has done is cut enormous amounts but allow it to actually exist. So I don't know how you call it an expansion when you have made enormous cuts to it, put a lot of poor people by the wayside, and 70,000 people have uh, lost their health care. 
So we, we, you know, I think we need to be clear that a speaker chop is not the guy who saved basic health. He's the guy who is telling us, I'll take you to the edge of the cliff a little bit slower. <laughs> Basically, because of my efforts, we have led the effort to expand healthcare in the state right now by over 300,000 people. 300,000 folks. I've been working on these issues for many years. And yes, we had some budget setbacks because of the greed of Wall Street that drove the revenue to the state down. Yes, we had to realize that. And when we could, we raised some revenue with support of people throughout the state of Washington to save the basic health plan, save education programs, and things like that. But we were put in a very difficult situation because of what happened in Wall Street and the economic collapse. Now, the other thing is that I really wish, uh, in fact, you're invited, uh, Shama, to, to attend a home care workers uh, rally. Uh, these are home care workers who take care of folks who are elderly and disabled. Those are real folks doing real jobs that really matter to people because when you get older or disabled, you need somebody to help you. And sometimes your family can do that, like my mom took care of my grandma at home. But nowadays, that doesn't happen very often. And so it was absolutely incredible, incredibly important that we care for folks who need that help. And we led the effort to do that. 42,000 people in that union, that's the second largest union, I believe, in the state of Washington. I'm very proud of that effort, working with them for many years to get the job done. I would now ask both candidates um, the second question, uh, which is very pertinent to a lot of people in this um, room, because it's about education. So funding for K-12 and higher education in Washington state has been eroded for decades, followed by a further $4.9 billion in cuts in 2009. Tuition at the state's public universities has risen over 65% since 2005. Student debt in the country has now surpassed $1 trillion. What is your plan for public education in this state? And we will start with Speaker Chop. <coughs> Well, this is a very important issue, and we need to do everything we can to, first of all, fully fund basic education. We have not done a good enough job on that. Uh, we agree that that's something needs to be done. We raised revenue when we could, a total of about $3 billion over a period of three years, uh, when we could in 2010. In 2010, that election, though, passed the Iman initiative that required two-thirds vote for any other revenue increases, so that's where we're at. Although that same uh, initiative that was passed by the voters with, I believe, 60%, uh, that is up before a Supreme Court decision, and maybe that might be overturned. I don't know. Uh, but I think that it's important to try to figure out what we can do in a coordinated way to improve funding for education. Let me give you a few examples. First of all, we need to close tax loopholes. Uh, whether you, you know, have heard about this or not, we closed, for example, two specific tax loopholes for Wall Street banks, totaling up to about $200 million in more revenue for the state for funding education. Uh, we also, a few years ago, passed the estate tax, which Bruce Ramsey here from the Seattle Times will report, they didn't really like that, but, <laughs> right, right, Bruce? That's right. Yeah, right, so, I, I, you know, they don't like me too much uh, because of that, but be that as it may, that was passed with 61% of the vote, but we did in the legislature. Why? Because it made the tax system more fair and it generated about $300 million of biennium, guess what, dedicated for the Education Legacy Trust Fund. Because of our effort there, that tax increase went to education, and when we had to Defended at the polls, we won 61% because we had a strategy about how to do that. Now, the next idea coming along, which actually a number of people have already uh, indicated their support, the next loophole is to close what's called a B&O tax credit on high-tech companies. This was started in 1993 before it was the legislature, and it basically gives uh, high-tech companies uh, an extra tax break. And what we did was uh, we're going to sunset it and dedicate that revenue uh, to higher education, but I guess my time is up, so, I'll, yeah, sorry. I agree, this is a very important question, and, uh, you know, as a teacher myself, I feel about this issue at a very, very personal level, and we know what's happening, you know, we know student debt has uh, surpassed a trillion, you know, tuition is skyrocketing everywhere in the country, including the state of Washington. And the youth are facing a bleak future. You're caught in a vice grip of student debt and dismal job prospects, even unemployment after college graduation. 
And uh, you know, and what's happening in the state of Washington? Let's look at the big picture. You know, there's lots of lots of little 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 details that we could get bogged down in. But let's look at the big picture. The big picture is that in Washington State, on average, four-year universities are now seeing nearly a hundred percent increase, meaning doubling of tuition. Imagine what that is. And I'm sure some of you don't have to uh, speculate. You're feeling that in actuality in your life as students. And the tuition at community college and technical colleges has risen by 54%. 41% of Evergreen students are at the poverty level and students are asking where they can park safely at night because they are living out of their automobile. So this is a very serious issue we are talking about. And what can be done? There's no shortage of ideas. In fact, at a banquet that Speaker Chubb attended, students at UW came, you know, the, his album Matter came, came up with an idea of, uh, you know, uh, cutting 80, $80 million in annual tax exemptions for large tech firms. So, you know, that's one idea. Another idea is to eliminate the 500 tax exemptions that have been given to big corporations. You know, why not do that? There's any number of ideas. The question is not whether we have ideas. The question is, do we have representation in Olympia that has the political will and the moral clarity to actually do this? Yeah. We'll have a response from Speaker Chop and then from Dr. Well, building on that, that, the meeting you're referring to at the Students of University of Washington, that's the group I proposed this idea of getting rid of the tax loophole because we found that the best or the biggest beneficiaries of that tax loophole was Microsoft, <laughs> which doesn't need it. Uh, and so we are letting that sunset, dedicating that $50 million into higher education to pay for high demand degree production. Basically, whether you want to be a nurse or whatever, we need more nurses, we need other kinds of folks uh, in the economy to meet the demand in this community. And then in addition, one of the things that we need to do is increase the state need grant. State of Washington is one of the best state need grant in the nation. We increase, we increase funding for the state need grant from 500 million to 650 million. In fact, if you're a student at the University, excuse me, at the Seattle University here, or at Seattle University, if you're a student here, you actually got increased help from the state need grant because we went from 500 million to 650. Now, the state doesn't set the tuition at Seattle University. Your board here does that. But we provided extra money because the students going to Seattle University, if they're qualified economically, get an extra boost because of that effort. We have one of the best in the nation. We're proud about that. Because if you look at the demographics of some of the universities, like the University of Washington, uh, there's a high degree of wealthy families whose kids are going there. Well, if they're wealthy, they ought to pay more tuition because they can afford to do that. The state dollars should help the low-income students who are struggling in order to get through college. This is extremely important. Yeah, thanks for organizing that. I think you only gave me two minutes yeah, before it, so. <laughs> oh, thank you. <laughs> That's all right. I didn't think I talked that long. Um, so, okay, so how do we deal with student loan debt? Here's a very specific idea. Uh, in the state, there's about $250 million being raised every two years for what's called the Public Works Trust Fund. What does that do? It lowers the interest rate on local public works, you know, things like curbs and gutters or water projects, things like that. Uh, so that now the interest rate that those local governments are paying is like, I think it might be 1%, because it's subsidized. Well, I'm proposing the same thing. If we can do it for potholes and water projects, we ought to do that same help for students to lower the interest rate. Now, when the, the Republicans were in charge under George Bush, the interest rate went up as high as 16% on student loans. Obama came in, reformed it, got it down to at one point at 3%. It's crept up again, I think, to a certain extent. We need to work to find a revenue source to basically set up a trust fund for student loans to subsidize the rate and basically do the same deal that I had. When I went to the University of Washington, graduated from there, I had a National Defense Education Act loan at 3%. I borrowed $3,000, paid it off early because I only had to pay 3%. We have got to do something to wake up this society and not wait for the next Sputnik to go overhead to jar us into action. So we have this very specific proposal to provide the same deal to low-income students just like I had at the University of Washington. So 
once again, uh, I wanted to focus on a couple of important points, although there is a lot I could uh, talk about, and I invite you all to spend more time with me and talk, talking to me one-on-one. -on -one. I'm very happy to do that. But I wanted to say, you know, one of the things that I hear uh, a very common refrain in speaker shops, uh, uh, you know, talk is that it's very difficult to do because it's the greed of Wall Street and, you know, the Republicans. I mean, there's always something. I mean, the question is, if you've been in power for decades, how come, you, you know, you're coming up with an excuse every single time there is a problem to do it? And I want to give you a very good example of how we need mass movements and how, in reality, uh, it doesn't matter how good an initiative is that people put in, for, put in front of the Democratic Party. If they don't want to pass it, they're not going to. So a very good example of that is what happened in the year 2000 to 2003. Uh, there were two initiatives that were put on the ballot through popular referendum. Initiative 732 to reduce class sizes and Initiative 728 to increase funding for schools so that teachers could get cost of living increases in the K-12 schools. So guess what happened? In this very conservative state of ours, Initiative 732, which uh, was to reduce class sizes, got the highest vote approval in history of the state, 73 something, you can go and check it, it's 70 something. Uh, the Initiative 728 to increase cost of living increases for teachers, that uh, also got a very good majority. And so what would you think? You would think that the Democratic Party, which says that you know we want to represent ordinary people, would grab at it. I mean, this landed on their lap. They didn't have to do anything about it, uh, do anything for it. The people did their work. Guess what happened? Governor Locke, Democratic governor, he was known as the education governor, he immediately said, oh, we don't have the $3.2 billion to fund this because we are living in hard times. You know, we're always living in hard times when it comes to education funding. And then he immediately turned around and gave, gave those $3.2 billion, you know, it's a cash gift to Boeing in the name of job creation. And I want to, you know, as an economist, I can give you a very long answer about how that is flawed, but I just want to give you a very small factoid in relation to this case, is that, you know, Boeing, was promising to create 1,800 to 2,000 jobs at that time, and in the name of those few jobs, all this money that, that by popular referendum was to go to education went to Boeing, and in that same period, Boeing cut 40,000 jobs, and Speaker Chop was the speaker then. So, you know, he's, again, we're, we're seeing instance of, after instance of leadership for the corporations, you know, and this is the problem. It's not that they, you know, probably they have good intentions. I think the Democratic Party does have uh, people who are well-meaning people. But the thing we need to understand is that the Democratic Party leadership's agenda is very much in line with the agenda of the super wealthy and big business. I mean, if we really want to address something, you know, I, I'm, I'm, I'm telling you lots of things. Like, just do one thing. You know, just do one thing. Address the regressive tax system. We have the most progressive tax system in the entire country. And when I debated a speaker job last time at the Stranger newspaper interview, he said that, you know, we need to, yeah, I agree, we need to make some changes to the tax system. No, that is not accurate. This is absolutely a horrendous tax system that we have where the poorest people pay the most. We don't want small changes to this tax system. This tax system needs to be thrown into the Puget Sound, and a progressive tax system needs to take its place. Yeah. I agree that this uh, tax system we have in the state is one of the most progressive. We're going to, yeah. Um, I don't have rebuttal to the rebuttal. No, I don't. <laughs> <laughs> no rebuttal to the rebuttal. Um, okay, what we <laughs> God, I was going to roll there. I, <laughs> I want to thank both of you for um, some very thorough answers, especially to the second question, which is really important to me as well as a professor. Um, at this point, we're going to have closing statements, and we will start with Dr. Sawant, and then with Speaker Chop, and then we will open the... Um, uh, questions to the audience, and you will have a limit of two minutes, to, so if you're out there preparing a question, I'm asking for a question and not a comment, and, um, and so we will have, you can direct it to a particular panelist or to both. So first, I will get the closing statement from Dr. Sawan. So in my closing statement, I wanted to address the, you know, the most immediate question at hand, which is, 
Should we as voters support the Democratic Party and continue supporting them till the end of time? Or should we fight for our own interests by creating our own representation? And we need to understand that, you know, this is, it's, it's, not a, it's not a very mysterious and complex thing. It's very clear. You cannot fight for ordinary people and students and the poor while you're feeding at the trough of the same big business that Republicans feed off of. So we need a party, we need representation that is not run by big business interests, but by ordinary people like you and me. Olympia is littered with the progressive bills that were chewed up and spit out by the two big business parties. And there are several examples I gave you, the school initiatives uh, right there. So the reality is this. We need to pick a side. Which side are we on? I'm a socialist. I'm an ordinary person. I'm a worker. I'm a teacher. I'm on the side of the 99%. And it, this, is, this is economics. This is, you know, this is just basic uh, understanding. We cannot solve these huge budget shortfalls without taxing the corporations and the super wealthy and ending corporate subsidies. And basically, the bottom line is this. The money has to come from somewhere. Somehow, we have to make sure that poverty is eliminated and employment is created and uh, education is funded. How are we going to make sure, right? Where is this money going to come from? The money can either come from the uh, you know, overfed, greedy corporations that are already running the show and getting the maximum and have been siphoning off the wealth on our backs, or the money can, can come from you and me who have already been battered by tax after tax after tax and budget cut after budget cut after budget cut. It's not really up to the Democrats. This question really is not to them, it's to us. What is our job here? What choice are we going to make? Are we going to make the choice of allowing this merry-go-round to continue forever? Or are we going to actually say, are we going to make a break from this business as usual and say, uh, what Occupy has been saying, that you know we need our own representation, we need our movement, and in reality, uh, you know there is no question that this campaign by itself is going to change much. We are very clear about that. We are, you know, we are not dreamers, as the Democrats often like to portray us as. We are realists, we understand, but this campaign can be a beginning. Imagine if today, I wasn't the only left candidate running in this country. Well, imagine if 200 other Occupy candidates were running in this country. Imagine how different the debate would have been. You know, think about that. And I want to leave you with a few closing notes. One is that we, of course, we are running to win, but we are also very clear that the system is rigged uh, enormously and all completely disproportionately against us. So we want to be, we want to make sure that everybody understands that our campaign is not an end in itself. It's the beginning of something, and, but that beginning of that wonderful something cannot happen with just me standing here. We all have to be together. We have to make sure that this campaign can lead to many other campaigns, many other movements. And, you know, again, just let's, let's state reality. We need a revolt. We need a huge movement to really shift things. I mean, things have been going really, really bad for us, not for the 1%. So let's start fighting for us. And in that spirit, I wanted to say that our campaign is hoping to start the dialogue for running uh, a slate of left-leaning candidates uh, for the city council, for the mayor. And in closing, I wanted to say that uh, Speaker Chuck, you know, I'm glad he's come here, has also agreed, uh, I think, uh, to uh, come to a stranger-sponsored debate. But time is running out, and I really urge you, Speaker Chuck, can we Get, you know, can we get together, you know, your office and mine by, before the end of this week and nail down some dates because I think people are hungry for debate. Thank you, Dr. Sawant, and now we're going to have the closing um, comments from Speaker Chuck. Well, thank you important. very much. Thank you, Joan. I appreciate that. Uh, yeah, we can get together later this week uh, and talk directly about that and working with various other folks, including other groups that want to sponsor things, because there's been quite a bit of interest. Uh, somebody was from Seattle Central Community College talked about that. So um, just to clarify a couple things, um, when you, the initiatives on the Initiative 728 and 732 passed, they passed overwhelmingly. I was heavily involved in those campaigns, but there was no revenue to pay for those things, to reduce classroom size or pay higher uh, colas for teachers. And frankly, you know, if you don't, pay for it, it's sort of like mom and apple pie. Everybody's in favor of teachers' uh, salaries going up, and everybody's in favor of lower class sizes. 
but I worked with the teachers and the other public school employees to restore the cut that happened uh, several years ago. And because of that, I earned their trust, and I'm endorsed by the WA, the Washington Education Association, the public school employees, the League of Education Voters, and countless other education groups. Because what this is about is building a, not only a movement, but a coalition of folks that can move, work together and move an agenda positively. And I'm very, very proud about this because I've worked for years in terms of working and reaching out to people to work on specific issues and programs and projects. And I'm glad, proud to say that I'm endorsed by Equal Rights Washington because we passed marriage equality. Uh, we uh, have the best uh, pro-choice le we have the best pro-choice legislation in the nation, and that's why I've been endorsed by NARAL and the Planned Parenthood votes. I work all the time with labor groups. Uh, I've been endorsed by the Labor Council, the WA, the Service Employees International Union, uh, the Aerospace Machinists, the State Council of County and City Employees, Children's Campaign Fund, Sierra Club, Cascade Bicycle Club, etc. Including my most recent endorsement, which was from the Amalgamated Transit Workers Union. Because I particularly like to point out that we have worked together to actually address issues like transit, because that's incredibly important not only to people in this room, but to the broader society in terms of dealing with tra transportation issues. A few years ago, we provided enough funding through our efforts at the state level to provide about $150 million per year in more transit funding. That was a tangible accomplishment that had we not done that, there had been a massive amount of cuts, but instead we actually increased transit service a few years ago because of that. So my goal in life is to build coalitions, uh, bring people together, have specific solutions about how we can move things to make things better for people, and then get the job done. And that's what I've been spending my entire life in, and I'm proud to be here tonight with you. Thank you very much. taxation. 
But I want to say that, you know, if you look at the profits that corporations are making, Microsoft last year alone made $23 billion in profit and is currently sitting on $36 billion of cash reserves. Why is it that we are being nickel and dimed when there is so much money and this state is a, a wash in wealth? The Seattle metropolitan area has the 10th largest concentration of wealthiest people, you know, households with more than $30 million in wealth. Why aren't we taxing wealth? Why aren't we doing all these things? And lastly, you know, Speaker Chuck mentioned that there was no money to fund the initiative 732 and 728, but I don't understand that. They turned around and gave that same money to Boeing. So there was money to give as corporate gifts, but there's no money when it comes to funding education. And I really agree with Tony Rain. Yeah, in the blue, sorry, with the peach. Yeah. Hi. Hi. Um, since uh, 2009, Washington State has received $42 million from the federal government as a reward for the Apple health care program for kids. Um, since it's a reward, apparently the government does not have to reinvest that money in Apple Health. And my question is that recently the budget had free health coverage for 27,000 immigrant children. My kids go to school, homeless kids and immigrant kids, and I don't care if they're here, here illegally or not. I want them to have health care. So why didn't we take this money, this $42 million, and put it into health care? Well, we did. That, it was actually 30,000 kids, and we funded them. I'll give you the budget figures. That was one of the big budget issues. There were proposals to cut that 30,000 kids by the governor, by the Republicans, by others. But we said, no, all kids ought to have health care. And we funded that using that $42 million, which we were very proud of, because it was based on uh, getting the numbers up in terms of percentage of kids um, you know, in enroll. So we met those goals. We got this bonus payment from the feds. We then invested it right into funding more health care for children. Literally, that's the case. Um, so, you know, I wanted to say that uh, before we get lost in the alphabet soup of this, uh, you know, all these many programs for uh, healthcare, a little bit here, a little bit there, there's a very easy solution single payer healthcare. And I wanted to. story of how our brothers and sisters, a little bit above us, you know, Canada, how they want their health care. You know, everybody wants uh, good, free, uh, good, you know, good quality health care. But how did they get it? They didn't get it because the liberals and the Tories were fighting for it. They got it because there were enormous mass movements, labor movements, you know, enormous numbers of people on the left coming together and they had these mass demonstrations and out of those movements arose grassroots candidates like myself and grassroots coalitions and those coalitions won the elections in the Saskatchewan province and the first thing they did was institute a big, you know, broad-based social set of social programs and single-payer healthcare was one of them and it was enormously successful. There's a reason why it is because it works because you don't have, you know, uh, insurance companies and pharmaceutical companies taking away big chunks of it for their own benefit. So what happened in Canada? All the people in Canada wanted that health care. They said, hey, Saskatchewan has it, I want it too. And there was such a clamor for it that when, you know, in the next general election, the central government came to power, they passed single-payer health care because they were afraid of the wrath of the people. They were afraid that if they did not pass it, then they would lose the next election. That is a good lesson for us. We have to be out there putting pressure, not becoming the graveyard of social movements, but becoming a true-to-life, you know, powerful movement demanding these changes. And it's not going to be easy because we have all these corporate interests aligned against us, but that is the only thing that works. news, but um, our speaker has an 
another commitment and has to go. So we are going to close the session right now. Um, the club does have some other activities that they will do, but I wanted to again thank both uh, Speaker Chop and Dr. Sawant for being here, having this very interesting debate of what I call left left, um, which is only possible in Seattle and on the coast. Thank you very much. Thank you. And so. Um, Thank you for everybody for showing up. It's been a great experience for me, and um, I hope to hear more from the both of you as this goes on. And I think my role here is done, and thank you all for coming.